Databases are all around you. Have you ever waited at the doctor's office while the receptionist punched in your information? Or asked a store employee to check their system for a special item? Then you've seen a database in action. The truth is, they're so useful you see them all the time. With Microsoft Access, you can manage your own database to suit the needs of your business or maybe the company you work for. But what exactly is a database? Well, it's a collection of information or data that's stored on a computer, allowing you to enter, access, and analyze it in a way you never could on paper. Let's think about that. Before computers, what sort of paper records do you think the doctor's office kept on file? Certainly a list of patients and their contact information. Also their medical history and a list of past appointments. That's how databases work, from the simplest to the most complex. They're basically a collection of lists, not on paper but on your computer, where programs like Access make it possible to organize your data, make it searchable, and so much more. Let's take a look. Say you're a hard-working amateur baker. You might decide to keep a database of all the cookies you know how to make and the people you make them for, your friends and family. A simple database because it only contains two lists. If you were a professional baker, your database would contain more. You'd have products and customers, and other things to keep track of like prices, sales units, and a list of orders. Does Access actually keep these things in a big long list? Not quite. Instead, it uses tables, like the ones in Excel, to list things in a little more detail. Take this example from the Amateur Bakers database. It lists friends and family, but also important information like who has a nut allergy and the rest of the table. So, if a database is essentially a collection of lists stored in tables, and you can build tables in Excel, why access? Why do you need a database at all? Let's compare. While Excel is great at storing and organizing numbers, access is better at analyzing and connecting other types of data. For example, names and descriptions, or your friends and their favorite cookies. The databases you'll be working with in Access can actually understand how different lists and their contents relate to one another. We call this a relational database, for its ability to understand relationships, and it's really what sets Access apart. Let's think about what that means while we go back to our Amateur Bakers database and build a third list to keep track of batches of cookies and who they're for. It's easy to see the relationship here. All I did was pull Dwayne from this list and Shortbread from here. Access can see and use that relationship too, but Excel can't. All of these things are completely unrelated as far as Excel is concerned. That means you wouldn't be able to pull from one list to another. Eventually, you'd find yourself typing the same thing over and over every time you needed to refer to Dwayne or your shortbread recipe or Dad and Chocolate Chip. In short, Access thinks more like you. It recognizes that the items in these three lists are connected. That makes entering, searching, and analyzing data so much easier, whether you have two lists or 20. Less to type, less to keep track of. Even the most complicated tasks can be made simple and user-friendly once you understand how access and databases work. If you've looked for a job online or searched for a book at your local library, you know firsthand what databases can do. But do you know how they work? What goes on behind the scenes? In Microsoft Access, databases are made up of four simple objects, tables, forms, queries, and reports. Together, these objects allow you to do all the things you associate with using a database, from storing and entering more and more information to analyzing and compiling search results. By now, you should know that a database is essentially a collection of data organized into many connected lists or tables. That puts tables at the heart of any database, the place where your information is stored. This table is from an actual access database, mine. It's a list of customers, one of the many things I keep on file to help me run my business, a specialty bakery. The familiar layout of horizontal rows and vertical columns takes on a new meaning here. In access, a row is more than a row, it's a record. Just like these are more than names and addresses, they're people, some of them my favorite customers. Each record begins with a unique ID number and spans several fields, including in this example, first name, last name, street address, and more. Notice I used the word field instead of column. In Access, fields are designed to organize the contents of your records without actually breaking them up. That means every entry in the first name field is going to be a name, and every entry in the street address field is going to be an address but no one will ever become separated from their record. That's their personal information. While tables are responsible for storing all this data, the other three objects, forms, queries, and reports, let you work with it. 
Forms are used for entering, modifying, and viewing records. Ever had to fill out a form while visiting the doctor's office or applying for a job? Forms are used so often because they're an easy way to guide people into entering data correctly. When you or someone else uses one of your forms in Access, that data goes exactly where you want it to go. This form makes it easy to add a record for a new customer or edit an existing one. Anyone can do it without ever having to face the size and scope of that table or the possibility of making a mistake. Queries give you a way to search for and compile data from one or more of your tables. Running a query is like asking a detailed question of your database or doing an advanced search on the Internet. When you build a query in Access, you're defining specific search conditions to find exactly the data you want. A query could help you find the name and number of every customer who's made a purchase in the last week, for example. That's something you might not be able to find just by looking at the records in your table. Reports give you the ability to present your data from any table or query in print. If you've ever received a printout of an invoice or an official school transcript, you've seen a database report. They're useful because they let you present parts of your database in a way that's easy to understand, even easy on the eyes, with colors, graphics, and other things that you can customize. So, now that you know how each object can be used, any idea how they work together? It helps to remember that they all work with the same data, the data stored in your tables. Let's take a look at a real-life example. If you've ever used an electronic card catalog to search for a book at the library, it probably looked something like this. Right now, I'm entering my search terms into what is actually a form. When I press this button, the database is going to create and run a query based on what I'm looking for, books in the series The Lord of the Rings. When the database finishes searching all of its tables, it returns a report of the records that matched, in this case, a list of books. All I have to do is click a book to learn its location and status. See how the objects all work together? First, I filled out the form then queried the database to search for the book. The query was able to pull from all those tables to produce a report. Imagine what it would be like if we didn't have these tools. What should be a simple task would become incredibly complicated and time-consuming. Understanding the four access objects and how they work together can make even the most complicated tasks fairly Before you jump into access, it's important to familiarize yourself with the interface so that you know where everything is. And we're just going to take a quick tour of the different areas of the screen that you'll be working with. Near the top of the window is a large toolbar area, and this is called the ribbon. The ribbon is a collection of most of the tools that you'll need to use in Access, and it's divided into different tabs. Just above the ribbon is another toolbar called the Quick Access Toolbar. Here you can save the current object, and you also have the undo and redo commands. And you can click the drop down arrow to add more commands to it if you like. On the left side of the screen, there is an area called the Navigation Pane. This contains a list of all of the objects contained in your database. All of the objects that are currently open will appear on the Document Tabs bar. And you'll use this to select which object you want to view or edit. At the bottom of the screen, you can use the Record Navigation bar to navigate through the different records one at a time. And to the right of that is the Record Search box, which you can use to search for a specific record. Now let's go back to the ribbon and look at it in a little more detail. The ribbon is designed to make things easy to find, so each tab is divided into groups. For example, here in the Forms group, we have several different commands for working with forms. While you're working on a database, you may notice that there are some extra tabs that appear on the ribbon with a label above them, and these will just appear automatically depending on what you're working on. In this case, we have a table open, so it opened up a couple of tabs to help us work with tables. Near the upper left corner, you'll see the File tab. If you click on it, you'll go to Backstage View, and this is where you'll find the Save options, and you can open your databases from here. And you can also print reports or view a print preview. And to get out of Backstage View, you can just click here. When you start working with databases, you'll use the Navigation pane to open and manage your objects. By default, it sorts all of the objects by type. 
If you want to sort them a different way, you can click this bar at the top of the navigation pane and then choose which sort method you want. You can resize the navigation pane by dragging the right border and you can minimize it by clicking the double arrow in the upper right hand corner. You can also hide the groups that you're not working on by clicking the bar at the top of each group. For example, I can hide the categories, products table, and sales unit so I can just focus on customers and menu items. Database designers will often set up a special kind of form called a navigation form, and this will appear automatically when you open the database. Instead of using the navigation pane and the document tabs bar to navigate through different objects, you'll use tabs within the navigation form. And this gives you a much more user-friendly way to work with the database. For example, the employees at this bakery only need to work with the orders, customers, and menu items. They can easily get to these by using the tabs, and some of the tabs will also have sub-tabs on the right. By using the navigation form, we can just focus on the objects that we need without having to worry about all of the other objects in the database. It's a great feature, but again, it's something that needs to be set up before you can use it. So those are the basics of how to get around and access, and in the next video, we're going to talk about how to open and save databases and objects. In this video, we're going to talk about opening and saving databases and objects. In Access, this works a little bit differently from other programs like Word or Excel, and it's important that you know how it works before you start editing databases. We'll start by opening a database. Make sure you're in Backstage View, then click Open. And if there are any recently opened files, they'll appear here. But if you don't see the one you're looking for, just click Browse. And then you can double click your file to open it. Now you may get a warning message here, so if you trust the source of the database, then click Enable Content. Now earlier I mentioned that Access is a little bit different from other programs, and that's because you're not going to be editing the database itself, but rather the objects within the database. Access treats each one of these objects as separate documents, and each one can be opened, saved, and closed individually. So you can think of the database as just a folder of different objects. Let's open a few objects. Just double click on each one, and I'm going to open a table, a query, and I think I'll also open a form, and a report. Each of these objects now has a tab on the document tabs bar. If you make any changes, you'll need to save the object before you close it. You can do that by clicking Save on the Quick Access Toolbar. And this only saves the current object. And to close it, you can click the X over on the right. If you need to rename an object, you can just right-click the name in the navigation pane and select Rename. And then type whatever name you want. To close the database, click the File tab and select Close. And in Access, you're not going to be saving your database because you're saving each object individually. And this may seem a little bit strange at first, but as long as you remember to think of the database as a folder of objects, then you'll be OK. Tables are the heart of any database because they are where the actual information is stored and we're going to talk about how to add, edit, and delete information from a table. In the navigation pane, double click on the table that you'd like to open, and tables will be marked with a blue icon next to the name. If you've used Excel or another spreadsheet program, then you'll probably find tables to be pretty easy to use, and they are very similar, but there are some different terms that we use when talking about an access table. Each row is called a record. In this table, every record contains a customer's name, address, and other information. Each record will have a unique ID number, and this number cannot be changed. So Jared Smith's number will always be 3, no matter what. Each column is called a field, and each field contains a different type of information. For example, here we have fields for the street address, 
city, state, and zip code. And just like in Excel, each box is called a cell. If you want to change the information in a cell, all you have to do is select it and then type in the new text. And let's say that this customer has a new email address. After you edit a record, you can save it by clicking Save on the Home tab. But whenever you click out of a cell, it's going to automatically save it for you. So if you're making a lot of different changes, you don't have to worry about saving each record. But it is a good idea to save the last one that you're working on, just to make sure that you don't lose any changes when you close the database. If you are editing more than one record, you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move between records. Or, if you prefer, you can use the arrows on the record navigation bar. You can also use the record navigation bar to create a new record. And then type in the person's information. If you want to delete a record, click the margin on the left side of the record. And then on the Home tab, click the Delete command. Now normally you should avoid deleting records because it can negatively impact the database if other objects refer to the record. For example, if we deleted a customer's record, it could cause the information in the orders table to be incomplete. But if you're just deleting a brand new record, then it's generally okay. For some edits, you may want to use the Find and Replace option to make a lot of changes at once. I'm going to open up the Products table, and on the Home tab, click the Replace command. And let's say that in some of our seasonal products, we want to change the word Fall to Autumn. Type in the word that you're looking for, and the word that you want it replaced with. And we'll select Current Document, so it'll search throughout the entire table. And we want to look for matches that appear in any part of the field. Click Find Next to look for the word. And it looks like the first instance of fall isn't referring to the season, so we'll skip this one and find the next one. And when you get to one that you want to change, click Replace. And just go through each one and decide whether you want to replace it. And generally, you don't want to use Replace All because that doesn't give you the option of skipping any of them. So you should only use this option if you're absolutely sure that it won't replace anything that you don't want. As you practice editing tables, keep in mind that most of your changes are saved automatically. So to be safe, you may want to create new records to practice with. In addition to changing the records within a table, you can also customize the way that the table looks and this can help to make the table easier to read. The first thing we're going to do is resize the cells. In this example, the description field is too wide, and I want to adjust it so it'll fit on the screen. To change the width of a field, just hover over a grid line, and you should see the cursor change to a cross with arrows, and then click and drag until the width looks right. The problem with this is that now the descriptions get cut off, so I need to make the rows taller so I can see the entire description for each item. And you'll notice that when you change the row height, all of the rows in the table will change to be the same height. Sometimes you'll have some extra fields that you don't really need to see all the time, and you can just hide them so that you can focus on the fields that you want. Just right-click the field name, and select Hide Fields. If you want to show them again, right-click any of the field names and go to Unhide Fields, and you'll be able to select the ones that you want to see. Normally, the row colors will alternate between white and some other color, and this helps to make it easier to read. If you want, you can change the color by going to the Alternate Row Color drop-down arrow, and that's found on the Home tab in the Text Formatting group. And you'll probably want to choose a light color so the text will have plenty of contrast. You can also control which grid lines are shown, and you can even have no grid lines at all. I'll go with the horizontal grid lines. And finally, in the bottom right corner of the text formatting group, 
You can click this little arrow to go to the Datasheet Formatting dialog box. And here you have some other formatting options that you can choose, including background color and grid line color. And you can see a preview of the formatting here. So experiment with the different formatting options to create the view that you're most comfortable with. We've already looked at how tables store information in a database, but you're not always going to be entering data directly into a table. Much of the time, you're going to be using forms instead. A form gives you a more user-friendly interface for entering data, and they make sure that the data goes exactly where it needs to. And sometimes the data just goes to one table, but other times it could be several different tables, and a form can keep track of that so you don't have to. Right now we're looking at the customer's form that was created for our database, and this gives us an easy way of adding or changing information in the customer's table. The difference is here we can just focus on one record at a time, and there are also some specialized tools like drop-down boxes and buttons for saving, deleting, and printing. We can use a drop-down box to find an existing customer, and we could also type a last name to jump to a record, and when we click on the name, their information will appear in these fields where we can then edit it. And I'm just going to change this customer's address. Now some fields may have a validation rule that limits the type of data that can be entered. For example, here the state needs to be a two-letter postal code, and if I try to type anything else, a window will pop up with instructions on how to fill it out correctly. And I'll change this back to NC. And when you're done, you can click Save. There's also a button to create a new record, which automatically clears all of the fields so we can type in a new customer's information. So if you wanted to, you could do most of these things by editing the table directly, but the form is going to be a little easier and faster to use. Now let's look at a slightly more complex form, and this is going to let us do things that we really couldn't do by just editing the tables. I'm going to open the orders form, and this is what the employees will fill out when the customer places an order. Let's just walk through the process of creating a new order. When you click New Order, it clears all of the fields, and then you can choose the name of the customer that's placing the order. And the information in this list comes from the customer's table, so every customer will need to already be in the database before they can place an order. And it automatically generates a new order number. When you click on the Pickup Date field, a calendar button appears, which makes it easy to quickly choose the date that you want. And there are also a couple of checkboxes for simple yes or no questions. Later, when you start creating forms, you'll be able to add these types of special tools to make your forms easier to use. And this form has a field where you can add notes if you want. Now here's where this form is a little bit different. When you click Add Item, it opens what's called a subform. And here you can choose the item that was ordered, type in the quantity, and then Save and Close. If the form doesn't update automatically, you can just go to the drop-down arrow below the Refresh command, and select Refresh. Then you can add another item, and you can do this as many times as you need to until the order is complete. Okay, now let's take a look at why forms are so important. When we place an order with this form, one of the tables that is modified is Order Items. Now it would be very difficult to edit this table directly. For instance, I don't know what menu item 156 is, and I don't remember which customer placed order number 7, but Access can piece together the order by looking up the correct records in different tables. So tables are sometimes organized in a way that's easy for Access to read, but difficult for a person to read, and that's why we often have to use forms instead of editing tables directly. These were just a couple of examples of forms, and the exact content and layout of a form will vary depending on how the form is meant to be used. But the basic process of using a form will generally be very similar, 
and it will be a combination of typing information into fields and using drop down menus, buttons, checkboxes, and other tools. In this video, we're going to talk about sorting and filtering. These are both tools that you can use to organize your data. They're really useful when you're working on tables, but you can use them with other objects as well. By default, tables are sorted by the ID number, but you can sort by any field that you want. First, click on the field name, and then on the Home tab, click Ascending or Descending. All of the records are now in alphabetical order by last name, making it much easier to find a specific customer. And if you want to clear the sort, then you can click Remove Sort in the Home tab. Now sometimes when you have a lot of data, it's easier to just hide the records that you don't want, and you can do that by creating a filter. There are several different ways that you can filter the data. If you click the drop-down arrow next to the field name, you'll see a list of all of the different values that appear in this field, and each one will have a checkbox next to it. So you can uncheck the ones that you don't want to see, and if you uncheck Select All, it'll clear all of them. And I just want to see the customers from Carrie. The drop-down arrow will turn into a filter icon to show that there is a filter on this field. And once you've created a filter, you can turn it off and on by clicking Toggle Filter on the Home tab. I'm going to open the Products table, and I want to filter based on the product name, but here I'd like to show all of the products that contain the word chocolate in the name. To do this, I'll select the word chocolate, and then in the Home tab, click Selection, and you'll have several different options. And I'm going to select Contains Chocolate. And now you can see that all of these contain the word chocolate somewhere in the product name. And just like before, you can click Toggle Filter to turn it off. Filtering by selection worked well here because we could just select the word chocolate in this first record. But let's say I want to look for products that contain the word butter. I don't see any of them here that I could select, and I don't really want to scroll through all of the records looking for that word. So instead, I'm going to apply a text filter. Click the drop down arrow and go to Text Filters. And we're looking for something that contains the word butter. And then you can type what you're looking for here and click OK. And this filter gives us results like peanut butter, butter pecan, and butterscotch. Now, if you're working with a field that has numbers, then you can apply a number filter. I'm going to open the menu items table, and I'd like to know how many of our products cost $30 or more. Click the drop down arrow, and then go to number filters, and choose greater than, and then in the dialog box, type 30. And now we could just count the number of records here, or we can just look at the record navigation bar. So we have 13 different products that cost $30 or more. And finally, with fields that contain dates, you can apply a date filter. I'm going to go to the orders table. Then you can click the drop down arrow and select date filters. You'll have a lot of different options, such as this week, last week, or next month. Or if you want to look at a specific month, you can go to All Dates and Period and select the month that you want. So experiment with the different sorting and filtering options, and keep in mind that you can always remove the sort or the filter to view all of the data. One of the most powerful ways of analyzing your data in Access is by creating a query. Running a query is like asking your database a question. A query can retrieve data from a single table or from multiple tables. And it all depends on how complex your question is. In this video, we're just going to focus on making a simple query that uses a single table. And this is sometimes called an advanced filter. Let's suppose our bakery has an upcoming event, and I want to get a list of all of our customers who live nearby so we can send them invitations. A query is going to be able to go into the customers table and find the names and addresses of the nearby customers. To create a query, go to the Create tab and then click the Query Design command. And then you'll need to select the table or tables that you want to retrieve the data from. We're just using the Customers table for now. Click Add, and then you can close this window. 
When working with queries, there are a couple of different views that we're going to use. If you click on the View drop down arrow, then you can see that we are in Design View. When we finish the query, we're going to be viewing the results in Data Sheet View. And you can use this menu to switch views whenever you want. The Customers table appears as a small window in the Object Relationship pane, which is this area here. And it has a list of all of the fields that are in this table, such as first name, last name, and street address. And I'm going to resize it so I can see all of the fields. What we're going to do is double click each field that we want to include in the query. We need the customer's name and address, so we'll double click on the first name, last name, street address, city, state, and zip code. And we're not emailing or calling them, so we don't need those fields. Each field now appears in the area below, which is called the design grid. Below the field names is the table row, which shows which table each field comes from. And this will become more important when we start dealing with multiple tables. And we're going to modify some of these blank cells to refine our query. We want the results to be sorted by last name, so in the sort row, we'll click the cell under last name and a drop-down arrow will appear. You can click it and then choose how you want it to be sorted. Next, we're going to use the criteria row to filter the records so that it's only showing the customers who live nearby. First of all, we want to send invitations to everyone who lives in Raleigh, so we'll type Raleigh in the city column, and since we're looking for an exact match, it will need to be in quotation marks. So far, this query will show all of the customers who live in Raleigh, but none of the customers in other cities. But one of the zip codes in Cary is close to Raleigh, and let's say we'd like to send those customers an invitation as well. To do this, we're going to need to add another criteria under zip code. Instead of using the criteria row, we're going to use the row below it, which is the OR row. We'll type 27513 in quotation marks. So now the query will show customers who are in Raleigh or in zip code 27513. Now the reason why we didn't put them both on the same line is that the customers would then need to meet both criteria. In other words, the customer would need to live in Raleigh and in zip code 27513. In some cases, you may want that, but in this example, it will not give us the correct results. Now we're finished designing this query, and the final step is to run it. Click the Run command on the Design tab, and the results will instantly appear in Datasheet view, which looks exactly like a table. If you scroll through the results, you can see that each customer lives either in Raleigh or in zip code 27513. If you want to make any changes to the query, you can click the View drop-down arrow and go back to Design View. And just like any object, it's a good idea to save it. I'll call it Nearby Customers. This was just a basic example, and in the next video we're going to talk about how to make a query with multiple tables. You may want to practice this one a few times before you go on to make sure that you're comfortable with the process. We've already talked about how to create a simple query that only uses one table, but queries that involve more than one table let you ask much more interesting questions to your database. Now this also takes a little bit more planning than a single table query, and there are four steps that you can use to help you design it. The first step is pinpoint exactly what you want to find out. In other words, which question are you trying to answer? In this example, let's say our bakery is sending out coupons to our customers who live outside the city limits to entice them to come back to our bakery. Obviously, we don't want to send them to people who live really far away. We just want to focus on people who live relatively close to Raleigh. And we're also just going to send them to customers who have previously placed orders at our bakery. The customers who meet all three of these requirements will receive coupons. So the question that we're trying to answer is, which customers live in our area are outside the city limits, and have placed an order at our bakery. The second step is to identify the information that we need. We'll need the customer's names and their contact information. And in order to know whether they've placed an order at our bakery, we'll also need to look at the order ID numbers. The third step is to locate the tables that contain the information that we need. 
In this case, the customer's names and contact information are stored in the customer's table, and the order ID numbers are stored in the orders table. So that means we need both of these tables in our query. At this point, we have enough information to start creating our query. Go to the Create tab and select Query Design. We're going to add the Customers table and the Orders table. And then close this window. And you can resize these if you need to. Then we're going to double click on the fields that we need. So we'll add the customer's first name, last name, street address, city, state, zip code, and phone number. And from the orders table, we'll need the ID field. When you have more than one table in a query, they will be joined by a line, and this is called a join. The join will often have an arrow that points to the left or the right, which tells the query which table to look at first. Sometimes you'll need to change the direction to get the results that you want. We're going to double click on the join to change it. And we want to select the third option which says include all records from the orders table. And in the next video we're going to talk a little more about why we're choosing this option, but basically this means that it will pull from the orders table first, which ensures that only the customers who have placed an order will be included. When you click OK, you can see that the arrow now goes from right to left. The fourth step is to determine which search criteria you need to use. We're going to be adding criteria under the city and phone number fields. First, we want to exclude all of the customers who are in Raleigh. To do this, we're going to need to use a very specific syntax. So for the city criteria, type not in and then in parentheses type Raleigh in quotation marks. And you can use this syntax whenever you want to exclude something from the query results. Now we also need some way of limiting the results to just the nearby towns. And in this case, we're going to do this by getting the area code from the phone number field. The 919 area code covers Raleigh and a number of nearby cities and towns, so this should give us a pretty good range. We'll need to use a syntax that looks at the beginning of each phone number. So type like, and in parentheses type quote 919, asterisk, end quote. The asterisk means that any phone number can come after the 919 area code. And there are many other syntaxes that you can use, and in the next video we'll look at a few other examples of these. Now in this case we're putting the criteria on the same row, because we want the customers to meet both of these criteria. If they just meet one of the criteria, then they're not going to be included in the query results. If we needed them to meet one or the other, then we would put one of these criteria on the next row. This query is finished now, so we can run it to see the results. And you can see that each customer meets both criteria. They are not from Raleigh, and their phone numbers begin with 919. So generally, more complex queries require more planning but you can make it a lot easier by just following the four steps of pinpointing exactly what you want to find out, identifying the information that you need, locating the tables that contain the information, and determining exactly what criteria you need. And in the next video, we're going to look at joins and search criteria in a little bit more detail. In the last video, we created a query that used two tables, and we just wanted our query to include customers who have placed an order at our bakery. Now we're going to talk about why we chose the type of join that we did, and we're also going to look at some examples of search criteria that you can use to narrow down your queries. In this example, we chose a right to left join because we wanted the query to pull in the records from the orders table first, and then use the information in those records to retrieve the records from the customers table. To understand how this works, let's look at how these tables are connected. Every time an order is placed, it's connected with a customer. And if someone places multiple orders, then they'll be connected with each of those orders. You'll notice that not all of our customers have placed an order, but all of the orders are connected with a customer. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when we're choosing which type of join to use. Let's look at what would happen if we connected these tables with a left to right join. First, Access retrieves all of the records from the customers table, and then it uses this list to get all of the orders that are connected with a customer. 
That means the query is going to include all of the customer records, even if they're not connected with an order, and this is not what we want. Instead, we want to use the order records to just pull in the customers who have placed an order. We can do this by choosing a right to left join. Now the query will first retrieve all of the records from the orders table, and it will then use that list to find all of the customers who are connected with at least one order. So whenever you're creating a query with multiple tables, you'll need to decide which type of join to use. You can double click the join to change it, and then choose option 2 for a left to right join, or option 3 for a right to left join. We are also narrowing down our query by using search criteria in the city and phone number fields. You may remember that search criteria have to be written with a very specific syntax so that Access can understand them, and they'll often need to include quotation marks and parentheses in order to be correct. So let's look at a few of the different syntaxes that you can use. If you're looking for an exact match, then you can just put your search terms in quotation marks. If you want to exclude something from the results, then you can use not in. And you can even exclude several different things by separating them with commas. If you're looking for terms at the beginning or the end of a field, you'll need to use the like syntax. And you'll notice that each one of these has an asterisk in it. This is known as a wildcard character, which just means that anything can go here. For example, if you're looking for phone numbers that begin with 919, then you'll type 919 asterisk. And that means this query will look for 919 followed by anything. And finally, when you're working with numbers, you can use symbols such as greater than and less than to test the values. And you can also look for numbers that are between two values. So those are some of the most common syntaxes that you can use. And you might not use all of these, but depending on what type of information you have in your database, you can probably find at least two or three that will be useful to you. Query that shows us a list of our bakery's customers who live outside the city limits. And there are a couple of things that I'm going to do to make the results easier to read. Sorting the results and hiding the fields that we don't need to see. Right now, I'm in datasheet view, so I'll need to switch to design view. And there are two ways of doing that. You can either go to the View drop-down arrow and select Design View, or in the bottom right corner, you can click the icon on the far right. In the data grid, there is a sort row, which is currently empty. To add a sort, you can just click on the cell for the field that you want to sort, and then click the drop-down arrow to choose a sort option. And now our results will be sorted alphabetically by city. You can also do a multi-level sort by just adding a sort to another field. A multi-level sort will always work from left to right, so this is going to sort first by city, and then within each city it will sort by zip code. If we wanted it to sort by zip code first, then we would have to change the ordering of the columns. And you can do that by clicking at the top of a column and dragging it to the left or the right. So this would sort first by zip code and then by city. But that's not what I want, so I'm just going to leave it where it was. Below the sort row, there is a checkbox for each field, and you can uncheck a box to hide the field in the results. We're using the phone number field to filter our results, but we don't actually need to see the phone numbers, so I'll uncheck this, and I'm also going to hide the ID field. And this is really just a way of making the results easier to read by reducing the amount of information that you have to look at. Now we can run the query again. And you can see that our results are sorted by city. And within each city, they're sorted by zip code. And the phone number and ID fields are hidden, so we can just focus on the names and addresses. We're going to talk about a really neat type of query called a totals query. Up until this point, the queries that we've done have pulled in results from one or more tables and listed them one by one. But a totals query does more than just list the results. It combines them according to their value and then performs a calculation such as sum, average, or count so that you get much more useful information. I'm going to start by opening the menu items ordered query in our bakery database. This query uses several different tables to give us a list of all of the items that have been ordered. 
If you look down the list, you can see that there's a lot of repetition, and that's because most of these items have been ordered more than once. If we change this to a totals query, then we'll have just one row for each item, and the values in the quantity field will be added up to show us what the total is for each item. First, you'll need to go to Design View, and then click the Totals command. And the Design Grid now has a new row called the Total Row. And right now, all of these say Group By, but we're going to change the one in the Quantity field. So click the drop down arrow, and we're going to select Sum so it will add the values together. And there are some other options such as Average, Minimum, Maximum count, and a few more, but in this case we want to use sum. Now we can run the query, and you can see that there is one row for each product, and the quantity field has changed to sum of quantity, and this gives us the total for each item. That means we can tell at a glance that we've sold 12 Christmas cakes, 9 carrot cakes, and 18 cheesecakes. You may notice that some of these product names appear on more than one row, and that's because they have more than one sales unit. For example, the chocolate chip cookies can be sold by the half dozen, dozen, or as single cookies, and these are really three different products, even though they have the same product name. So now that Access is calculating these totals for us, we're able to get a much better idea of what people are buying from our bakery. At some point, you're probably going to want to present some of your data to another person, and Access lets you create professional-looking reports to do this. Just like a query, a report can pull in information from one or more tables or queries, but it gives you a lot more control over how the data looks on the page. In this video, we're just going to focus on making a simple report based on a single query. I'm going to open the Orders query, but you can use any table or query that you want. And then in the Create tab, click the Report command, and your report should instantly appear. Now it's probably not going to look perfect, so at this point you can clean up the layout. And to do this, you'll need to make sure that you're in Layout View. In this report, some of these columns are too wide, so I need to adjust them. When you click on a column, a yellow border will appear, and you can drag the edge to change the width and I'm adjusting each column just enough to make everything fit on the page. If you make your columns too narrow, then you may cut off some of your data. You can also get rid of any extra fields that you don't need. We probably don't need the zip code in this report, so I'll delete it by pressing the Delete key, and I'll also delete the title and these empty cells. I'm going to scroll through the report now to make sure that everything looks right. And if any elements are outside this dotted line, then they're going to be off the page when you print it. So I'm going to drag this page number over to the left. Now one thing you can't do within a report is edit records. However, you can sort and filter them. I want to just show the orders from December. So I'll right-click the Pickup Date column, and then go to Date Filters, all dates in period, and select December. And I'd also like these dates to be sorted. I'll right-click them again, and choose Sort Oldest to Newest. When you're done changing the layout, you can switch to Report View, and this will let you view it without the grid lines. And finally, we should save this report I'll call it December Orders. And now we have a report that we can come back to at any time if we want to make changes or print it. Once you've finished creating a report, you can choose to either print it or export it so it can be viewed outside of Access. Make sure that you're in Print Preview. And here you have several different options for adjusting the report. The first thing you should do is click the Size command, and make sure that you have the correct paper size selected. I'd like to add wider margins so that we can make notes if we need to. But you can see that now some of the data is cut off. 
We can use the page navigation arrows at the bottom to go to the next page, and we can see that the missing data is showing up here. We can fix this by switching to landscape orientation. Now all of the fields fit on the same page. And you could also fix it by going back to layout view and making the fields narrower so they all fit. I'm going to click the zoom drop down arrow and select fit to window so we can see how the report looks on the page. It looks like we have plenty of room for notes. And if we wanted to fine tune the margins, then we could just click page setup. And finally, if you want to save ink, then you can click print data only to get rid of the background colors. But I'm going to leave this unchecked because I like the formatting that we have. When you have everything the way you want it, you can click the print command and then set your printer settings and click OK. Sometimes you may prefer to export a report instead of printing it. This is useful if you want to email it to someone or post it on the web. Access lets you save it as an Excel spreadsheet, a text file, a PDF or XPS file, or email attachment. And you can click More to save it as a rich text file or HTML file. In this case, I'm going to choose PDF because that's going to keep the formatting that I've applied to my report. I'm just going to save this to my Documents Library. And you can modify the file name if you want. And then where it says Save as Type, select PDF. Then click Publish. And your report will be saved to your Documents Library or whichever folder you chose. Then you can close this window. When you're done, you can close Print Preview. And it will go back to the last view that you were in. In this example, I'd like to create a menu that we can print for our bakery that shows a list of our products and their prices. We're going to need to create a report that uses multiple tables, and the easiest way to do that is by using the Report Wizard. First, we'll go to the Create tab, and in the Reports group, select Report Wizard. We'll start by choosing the fields that we want in our report. If you click the drop down arrow, you'll see a list of all of the tables and queries in your database. And we're going to add fields from several different tables. From the Categories table, we're going to need the Product Types field. And you can either double click it or click the right arrow button to add it. Next, we'll choose the Products table. And here we'll add the product name and description. From the Sales Unit table, we'll add the product name, which in this case is just dozen, half dozen, or single. And finally, from the Menu Items table, we'll need the price. So all of these fields are going to be placed into our report. Now click Next. Since we're using multiple tables, we need to decide how we want the tables to be organized on the page. If we had just used a single table or query, then it would have skipped this step. In this case, we want it to be organized by the Categories table. And to the right, you can see a kind of outline which shows where each field will go. Now we'll go on to the next step. Here, you can change the way that the records are grouped by adding a grouping level. Much of the time, you won't need to do anything in this step, but if you have a very specific idea of how you want the report to be organized, then you can add a grouping level. For example, if we wanted the products to be grouped into dozen, half dozen, and single units, then we would add sales unit, and then use the arrows to change the priority. But we don't really want that here, so I'll remove this, and then click Next. Here we can sort the records by up to four fields. I'm going to sort by price, and I'll also change this to descending, so it will start with the highest price. And then click Next. There are a few different layout options that you can choose from. I'm going to select Block because it'll tend to keep things on the same line. I'm going to leave the orientation as Portrait, and I'll also leave the Auto Adjust option checked, so we won't have to do quite as much adjusting at the end. 
And in the final step, you can type in a name. I'm going to call it Menu Report. And here you can choose whether you want it to open in Print Preview or Design View, but this won't actually affect the report. When you click Finish, it will create the report. And you won't be able to go back into the wizard to edit your report, but you can always go to Layout View to make any adjustments that you want. Access gives you a lot of flexibility when it comes to formatting a report. You can use any fonts and colors that you want, you can change the theme, and you can even add a header, footer, and company logo. In this example, I'd like to start out by changing the fonts, and I want to put the descriptions in italics and make the product names bold. To do this, we'll need to be in Layout View. First, select the column that you want to change. You can also hold down the Shift key if you want to select multiple columns. Then go to the Format tab and choose the font that you want. I'm going to pick Cambria. Now to make the descriptions italic, I'll select them and click the italic command. And then I'll select the product type and make it bold. I think I'll go ahead and delete the field headers. Anybody who sees this menu will know what each column is, so they don't really need to be labeled. At this point, we can switch to Print Preview to see how it looks. The new font and italics really help to give it a more distinctive look. Now I'd like to add a page header, which will include the address of our bakery. To do this, we'll need to go into Design View, which we haven't looked at yet. Here you can make some of the same types of adjustments you can make in Layout View, but it also lets you do some other things like adding headers and footers. You'll see several bars, and find the one that says Page Header. You'll need to make sure that there's some empty space below it, and if there isn't any space, then you'll need to click on this border and drag it down. Then in the Design tab, find the Controls group, and you'll want to click on this icon, which is the Label command. And then in your page header, click and drag to create a box. You can type whatever you want here, and I'm going to type our bakery's address, phone number, and email address. And if you want, you can also edit the Report header, Page footer, and Report footer in the same way. Let's go back to Print Preview to see how our header looks. I think it looks good, so I'm not going to change anything. Now, if you scroll down, you can see that today's date and the page number are in the page footer. These were automatically added for us because we created this report with the report wizard. However, you can also add them manually by going to either Layout View or Design View, and then clicking Page Numbers or Date and Time on the Design tab. Now one thing that will make this report look much more complete is a company logo. So I'll click the logo command, and then you can select the picture that you want, and then click OK. OK, now this may be hard to see, but our logo has been added in the report header, and it has an orange box around it. I'm just going to drag this corner to make it larger, and then I'll move it over to the center of the page. I'll also move the title to the center, and I think this title would look better if it just said Menu. And finally, you can change the overall look of your report by selecting a different theme. A theme is a set of colors and fonts that applies to your entire database, and that means it can affect your other objects as well. If you want, you can even mix and match colors and fonts from different themes. All of these little details that we've added to our report make a big difference, and now it actually looks like a real menu that we can print and give to our customers. Sometimes you may decide that you want to add or modify fields in your tables. Access makes it easy to do this, although there are some important things that you'll need to consider. There are three different rules that you can apply to control the type of data that the fields can accept, and these are data types, character limits, and validation rules. 
To get started, make sure that you have a table open. I'm using the customers table. We're going to scroll all the way to the right until you see a blank field that says click to add. And when you click on it, you'll see a list of all of the data types that you can choose from. Short text is the default option, and this is the type that you'll use for regular text such as a person's name or address. You'll also use it for numbers that aren't used in calculations, like a phone number or a zip code. For any numbers that you might want to do calculations with, you'll need to choose number. For example, we would use this for the quantities of an item that were sold. If you're dealing with money, then you'll choose currency. And if you choose date and time, then when you're editing that field, you'll see a calendar icon which you can click to select a date. But in this case, I just want a simple yes or no answer, so I'll choose this one. And this adds a checkbox for each record. Then you can type in the name of your field. I'm going to name it Add to Mailing List. Then I'll resize this field. Now we can just check each customer who wants to be on our mailing list. And you can also click and drag the name to move the field wherever you like. If you decide that you need a different data type for a field, then you can just select it and then go to the Fields tab and click the Data Type drop-down arrow. I'm going to change this to text so I can add additional information in this field. And some of our customers want to receive our weekly newsletter, but others just want to hear about our special events. Now you should be very careful about changing the data type because it is possible to lose some of your data if you change it to the wrong type. In some fields, you may want to narrow down the data even further by adding a character limit, and you can only do this with text fields. For example, we want all of the states to be formatted the same way, so we're only using the two-letter state abbreviations. If some of the records say NC and others say North Carolina, then Access won't know to group them together, which means our sorts, filters, and queries may not work right. In the Fields tab, find the Field Size box. The default field size is 255 characters, but I'm going to change it to 2. And you may get a warning message here, so if you're sure you want to change the field size, click Yes. In this case, setting a character limit isn't quite good enough, because somebody could still type a two-letter code that's not a real state, for example, NX. To prevent that, we need to be a lot more specific about what types of input this field will accept, and we'll do that by adding a validation rule. In the Fields tab, go to the Validation command on the far right, and select Field Validation Rule. Here, I'm going to type each state abbreviation in quotation marks, and I'm separating each one with the word OR. And this may take a while. So this expression is just looking for exact matches, but if you want, you can create validation rules using the same syntaxes that we talked about in the query lessons. For example, you could use the like syntax to set a validation rule that only allows text that ends with cake. Or, if you're using numerical values, you could use greater than to make sure that none of our quantities are negative. When you're done, click OK. Whenever you create a validation rule, it's important to create a validation message. And this option is also under the validation command. This message will pop up whenever somebody tries to type in something that doesn't follow the validation rule. The message should briefly describe the rule so that the user can then make the necessary corrections. In this case, I'll just mention that it needs to be a two-letter abbreviation. Now, you won't need to add a character limit or validation rule to all of your fields, but you can add one or both of them whenever you want to control the types of information that your field will accept. Creating a form can save you a lot of time in the long run because it makes it easier to input the data into one or more tables. And in this video, we're just going to go over the basics of creating a form from a table, adding additional fields, and inserting a drop-down menu into the form. In the navigation pane, you'll need to select the table that you want to use, and you don't need to open it, just make sure that the name is highlighted. I'm using the Customers table. Then in the Create tab, you can click the Form command, and it will create a new form that contains all of the fields from your table. And before you do anything else, you should save this form. I'll call it Customers Form.
is sometimes your form will include a subform. Access will create one of these if your table is linked to another table. For example, here our customers table is linked to the orders table, so the subform will include a list of any orders that the customer has placed. In many cases, this may be useful, but if you don't need the subform, you can delete it by just clicking on it and pressing the delete key. Now, if we later decided to add a field to the customers table, it would not appear automatically in this form, so we would need to add it manually. To do this, you can select Add Existing Fields from the Design tab, and this will open up the field list, which shows all of the fields from this table. You can just double click a field to add it to the form, or if you want to add a field from a different table, click Show All Tables, and then locate the table and field that you want. But for now, we have all of the fields that we need, so I'm just going to close this pane. With some fields, you may want to add a drop down menu, which Access calls a combo box. This can make the form easier to use because the user can just click on the value that they want. I'm going to create a combo box for the Add to Mailing List field. In the Design tab, find the Controls group and select the Combo Box command. Then you can just click on the form where you want it to go. The combo box wizard will open up, and if you have a long list of values, then you can click the first option to pull the values from a table or a query. But I'm going to select the second option so that I can type the exact values that I want. Here you can type in each value, and in most cases you'll just use the first column, I'm typing three different values, and I'm pressing the Tab key after each one to go to the next row. And if you need to, you can adjust the width of the column, and then click Next. Now this next step is very important. When the user chooses a value from the combo box, we want the value to be stored in the customer's table. We'll need to select the second option, and pick the field that we want. In this case, our combo box is going to be asking about the mailing list, so I'll choose the Add to Mailing List field. And then in the last step, you can type a label. I'm going to call it Add to Mailing List. And click Finish. The combo box will appear here, and we don't need the original field anymore, so we can delete it. To test the combo box, we can switch to Form View, and you can see that our three options appear here. So now we have a working form, and in the next couple of videos, we're going to make some more adjustments to it to make it better suit our needs. When you're creating a form, Access allows you to make some very detailed changes using the Property Sheet. To open the Property Sheet, first make sure you're in Layout View, and then in the Design tab, select the Property Sheet command. There are several different tabs that you can choose from, and in each row you'll see the property name on the left and the value on the right. And sometimes you'll need to type in the new value that you want, but some properties have one or more buttons that you can click to choose a value. Now you should always pay close attention when you're making changes, since there are so many options, it may be difficult to remember exactly what you've changed and what the original values were. But if you don't remember what each property does, you can just click on it, and a brief description will appear in the bottom left corner of the screen. So this property controls the vertical position of the object relative to the top of the form. In this form, I'd like to hide the ID field. I'll select it, and then in the Property Sheet, I'll go to the Format tab, and then find the property that says Visible. Right now it's set to Yes, but you can click on it, and then use the drop-down menu to change it to No. We can switch to Form View to test it, and this field is now invisible, and at any time if we wanted to make it visible again, we could go back to the Property Sheet and change it. Now I'd also like to modify the orders form. I'll first switch to Layout View. In this form, I'd like the Pickup Date field to default to the current date, 
whenever we create a new order. I'll select the field, and then in the property sheet, I'll click the data tab, and then find the default value property. In order to get the current date, we'll need to add an expression. Click this button to open up the expression builder. In the lower left, there is a box called expression elements. There are several different options, and click on the one that says common expressions. And then to the right of this, we can choose either current date or current date and time. We'll just choose the first one. To the right of that, double click date, and it will appear in the area above. Then when you click OK, the expression will appear in the property sheet. And let's switch to form view so we can test it. When we create a new order, it clears all of the fields, but the pickup date field will default to the current date. We can still change it if we want to, but for most orders, we're probably not going to need to, and that's definitely going to save us some time in the long run. In the next video, we're going to finish the customer's form by making some adjustments to the layout and the formatting. I'm working on a form that we can use in our bakery to view and edit the customer information. And I know the employees are going to be using this form a lot, so I want to make it as pleasant and easy to use as possible. To do that, I'm going to need to make some adjustments to the layout and formatting. The first thing I'm going to do is add a command button that the user can click to search for a specific record. To add a command button, you'll need to be in Layout View. In the Design tab, find the Controls group. Click on the drop down arrow and make sure that Use Control Wizards is selected and then select the button command. Then in the form, click where you want the button to go. There are many different actions that you can choose from, and they're organized under different categories. Most of the time, you're probably just going to use actions from the first four categories. The one that I want is in Record Navigation, and it's called Find Record. Then click Next. Here, you can choose whether you want the button to display text or a picture. In this case, I'm going to use the default binoculars picture, but you could also browse for another picture if you want. In the last step, you can type a name for the button. I'll call it Search. And this text will not appear on the button, but it may be helpful if you need to edit the button later with the property sheet. Click Finish, and your button will appear on the form. At this point, I want to move and resize the field so we can get a better view of everything. I think everything would fit a lot better if I put it into two columns. You can adjust the fields just like you would in a report. For example, you can click on a cell and then drag the edge to resize the column. Next, I'm going to go to the Arrange tab and then in the Rows and Columns group, select Insert Right to add a column. I'm going to click it twice so we have one column for the field labels and another for the actual fields. Then I'll just click and drag the fields where I want them. You may end up with some empty rows, and you can just click on them and press the Delete key to get rid of them. And I'd like the Other Notes field to be larger, so I'm going to merge it with the other cells in its row. I'll hold down the Shift key while I'm clicking on each cell, and then on the Arrange tab, I'll click the Merge command. Finally, I'm going to make some adjustments to the colors and fonts just to make it look a little nicer. And again, this is exactly like formatting a report. You can go to the Design tab to add a logo or choose a theme, but keep in mind the theme applies to your entire database. So if you want to make changes that will only apply to this form, you can use the commands in the Format tab. Here you can adjust the colors and fonts of individual elements in the form. I'm going to control click the fields that I want to change. And now I can adjust the fill color, outline color, and outline weight. I'm also going to choose a background color 
and add a few final touches. Okay, my form is now finished. I've added the logo for our bakery. I've added a shadow to the search box from the Shape Effects menu. And I've also changed the font of the form header. Now it may take some time to get the form exactly how you want it, but once you do, you'll have a professional looking form that's easy for people to use.